Hello and welcome to my latest live stream on infrared photography. So what we'd like to do today is uh, look at some of the questions and the images that people have submitted. Uh, we will we will try to answer those questions as best that I can and we'll edit some images uh, and talk about light uh, infrared photography in general. So um, if you have questions about infrared photography, uh, welcome. Feel free to put them in the chat if you're here live. Um, if you're interested in learning more, of course, please check out my book uh, at infraredbook.com because it is loaded with most everything that I've learned about infrared photography and is a great place to get many of your questions answered. So please check out my book at infraredbook.com. Okay, so let's dive in. Welcome, everybody. Hey, to those who are here, uh, Fendias, uh, Chris, thanks for coming. Uh, let's get started. So uh, first thing, first up, we have some images from Andrew uh, that were submitted. Uh, so we've got uh, the last live stream was, what, maybe five weeks ago. So we've got a whole bunch of stuff that's come in since then. Um, and we'll start off with some images from Andrew. Andrew submitted a couple images and he uh, shared both uh, a raw image and a, um, a, a JPEG. So when people do that, then I, I typically take the advantage, uh, the, the opportunity to uh, uh, edit the raw and, and walk through it at my pace and then compare that to, uh, to what, uh, the, uh, what the individual's edit looks like. Um, so we can, we can talk about the differences because they're not going to be, they're not going to be exactly the same. Uh, welcome, Kathleen. So uh, let's, let's dive in here and let's, let's get right into editing. So we'll start with Andrew's images. So let me pull this up. So we will, let's see here, have to get back into the swing of things here and let's, all righty. So let's get started. So here we are in Adobe Lightroom Classic, um, and this is where we'll get started. So let's start with this image. We'll start with, uh, my edit and then we will, uh, move on to talking about, uh, we'll look at Andrew's edit and then we'll compare the two. So the first thing that I want to do, of course, uh, when working with infrared some of I'll do some things. I'll cover some of the details uh, in this first image in a little bit more depth, and then I'll go much quicker in future images. So the first thing that we'll want to do is set a white balance. So I will grab my white balance picker, and I'll select an object here. So it could be what what do we want to select? It could be the tree. It could be uh, the foliage, um, and 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 let's talk about a little bit about why you would do that. So welcome to uh, welcome Harold and. Yos for coming. Thank you so much. So uh, first of all, before I, I do that, let me just do a quick auto so we can see this a little bit better because it's very dark. Okay. So when we're setting a white balance, uh, there's, there's a few things that we want to think about. Uh, the, the first thing is, can we actually set a good white balance? And typically with uh, Adobe products, we cannot. So in this image, you see that I'm, I'm capped down at, at uh, 2000 Kelvin. Uh, infrared light actually has a white balance of around 900 Kelvin, which is way below the range. So we're going to need a profile uh, to help us get a better white balance. So the first thing that I'll do is go up into profile here and I'll select one of the two profiles that come with this camera from the infrared profile pack. So you can get that from my blog. The link is in the description. Uh, if you don't have, there's now like 320 some uh, cameras that are supported. So get this to help you set a good white balance. So I'll grab one of these and the colors get wonky, but that's okay. Now I can set, a, I grab the picker again and set a white balance. And you'll see that uh, the uh, white balance is now good in the sense that it's not capped at the bottom or top of the range. Okay. So that, that helps me a lot. So now I'm, I, I, I can think about what I want to do. So now that I've set a white balance, um, I can, uh, think about swapping colors. So let's, let's look at swapping colors. So I have, there's lots of ways to swap colors. You can, you can go, you can do a, a hue shift right here in Lightroom. You could take the image over to Photoshop, uh, and work, uh, swap, do a channel mixer. I've got a number of actions in Photoshop. Those are all downloadable as well. Or you can use, uh, profiles that have been created in Lightroom color swap profiles that will do the trick here. And so I've got a variety of options here. We'll, we'll, we'll just pick one and I won't get into the details yet at this point of what they are. So let's just pick one of these options. Let's pick invert. This is a good option. 
and I'll close this. So now let's go back and let's talk about white balance a little bit more. So one of the, when, when you're selecting a white balance, there's a variety of things that you might do to determine why you're selecting the white balance you're selecting. So one reason might be if you want to create, if you have multiple types of colors in the image. So so if, if you have a very colorful image, say with a 590 nanometer filter or even an orange filter, like a 5, 515, 520, 560 filter, you might have these, uh, you, you'll have a strong color for the sky and you'll have a strong color for the foliage and you might want to separate those and then have your neutrals be neutral. That's one approach. This image, this looks to be like a shot with a 720 nanometer filter. So this particular image, uh, with, with a 720, the colors are going to be more subtle and you have a couple choices. So you can either pick a neutral subject to white balance on. So let's say I might pick the this fence post uh, or I might pick the tree. The idea of, of separating colors means that you'll get one color in the, the foliage and one color in the sky. In fact, so if I go back to looking at these profiles, it's kind of hard to see. If I pick this profile, you'll see there's a hint of color that's coming up in, in the foliage. Not a lot, but a hint. But a lot of times with um, 720, you may want no color. You may want white foliage. And so in that, if that's the case, you can white balance on the foliage, and then that will become white, and then the sky is blue, and then that becomes the, the style that you're looking for. So, so some things to think about uh, when you're working with a... Uh, a 720 nanometer image. So let's go back to, to my edit here. I'm going to do another auto now that I've got some settings put into place here. Um, and you can see if, if you look up, let's look at the, um, up here at the histogram, you'll notice that it's a very compressed histogram. And this is something you'll see with some infrared images, especially 720. Um, you'll see that it is, it doesn't have a lot of contrast. And so I'm going to, I'm going to go in and try to create some more contrast. So I can do that in a variety of ways. I'll increase the contrast slider. I could go into tone curve and I could quickly pick one of these tone curves to add some contrast. I can also do it in the basic panel under uh, clarity dehaze. So these are some areas where you might, you might add some contrast. And I could do this, I could do this globally here in the basic panel, or I could do it with masks. For this first image, we'll just stick with globally. Uh, let's see here. So um, uh, Chris, thanks for having a live stream European friendly times. Yep. So I've, I've been alternating doing some on Saturdays that, that is better for the whole world, uh, and, and some during the week. Um, let's see, uh, see if there's any other questions here. Good morning, everybody. Good, good morning, good afternoon and good night. Um, as, as, uh, Truman used to say, uh, let's see here. Does it make sense to, Yoast says, does it make sense to use a calibration tool like a color checker passport to set the white balance? Um, the, the answer to that is no, and that's because they're just not designed for uh, infrared. Y you, can, you can try, but the problem is, is that the calibration is just too far out of the norm. So th those, pass those um, white balance checkers are really good when you need absolutely precise color uh, with your camera and you want to create your own profile uh, if you're shooting, say, fashion or food or something, visible light where you need really, really precise colors. But infrared, those the, the calibration just won't work well with those. And so it's it's really not worth the investment unless you're doing working in one of those areas. Um, all right. So hello. Thanks, everybody, for joining from around the world. Okay, so let's get back to this image. So... Um, Let's see, what, what what else could I do with this image? So the, a couple things, let's see, you could, you know, when I think about something like clarity, here's another thing to think about. Um, I can either go with a positive sense of clarity or I could go with a negative if I want kind of a softer look. Sometimes people like that because it will mimic the the look of, of um, infrared film. We'll have kind of this glow, this blooming glow in the highlights. Um, and I can do that here. Or, or if I wanted to get more detail, I could go into masking. I'm not going to get to masking yet in this image, but I could go into masking and I could uh, select the, say, the tree trunk and make that a little sharper. And then I could go into some of the foliage and, and, and or the highlights and make those bloom a little bit. So that's, that's something that you could do. Okay, so now this is kind of a, a good solid start here. So let's 
compare this with the edit that um, that uh, Andrew did. So I'm going to hit C, and I'm going to go into the comparison. Let's actually compare to, uh, let's see here. Now, now, this is the point where I have to remember how to use the comparison tool because <laughs> I don't use it very much. Okay. Oh, there we go. I think it was control. Oh, boy. Not that one. All right. Okay, here we, that, here we go. I figured it out. I knew I would remember. Okay. So, uh, on the left, we have... Let me just hide this for a second. So, on the left, we have my quick edit. Uh, which which I think has a similar sort of uh, color um, and and uh, the, the coloring is the same as the edit that Andrew did. Um, Andrew's edit he he really punched up the blue in the sky, uh, which actually I think works really well in this image. And it looks like there might be some uh, some uh, maybe some a little bit of blooming that's happening in the uh, in the foliage. So maybe that is some negative clarity or some other method. So uh, so that looks very good. So I, I actually like uh, the 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 blue that blue looks really good uh, with the in contrast with the white. Now maybe a little bit more saturated than I would do, but to each his own. Uh, everybody everybody has the opportunity to do this in the way that they prefer. That's one of the the beauties of this. So let's take a look at another image uh, that Andrew uh, provided. Uh, kind of the same thing. Let's check check the chat here. Um, let's see. Uh, Miguel says, hello, everybody. I'm, I'm testing with the Hoya 720 filter and getting exposures of 90 or 120 seconds. I can't get the white color in the vegetation. So so the, the, uh, the, the, the times you're getting, normally, if you're using an unconverted camera and a 720 nanometer filter, I think your exposures are probably going to be normally around, even with the lowest ISO, they're probably going to be around 5, 10, 20, 30 seconds, somewhere in that. So if you're getting 90 to 120 seconds, that tells me that something else is going on. Either you're using too high of an f-stop, you don't want to do that because you'll get diffraction, so get down to a lower f-stop, um, or there's something else going on. Uh, but the, but the getting the white color is going to be more challenging with an unconverted camera because you will get more color that's coming through, excuse me, compared to using a converted camera. So that's, a, it is normal to get more color saturation in foliage with an unconverted camera. And then at that point, you can either use your white balance, kind of like we did in the last image, you can white balance on the foliage to get rid of some of that color, or you could desaturate it. And I've got some videos on desaturating that. Um, and so, uh, so that's something to keep in mind there. Um, let's see. Okay, excellent, excellent. So let's move on to this, uh, the next image from Andrew. Um, so again, same thing. So we'll, we'll, we'll go a little bit quicker here. Uh, we are going to just jump right into selecting a profile. I'll select 100 again. And again, for white balance, you've got some choices here. You could white balance on the trees. This is, again, looks like a 720 nanometer filter image uh, with, with a converted camera. Uh, that would be my guess. Uh, the, you could convert, you could white balance on the trees. You could white balance on the path. It just depends on the, the colors you're trying to get. Um, so let's, let's try a little, some new approaches on this one. So I'm going to, first of all, we'll do a quick color swap. So I'll go down to my neck. I use the negative 100. So let's go down here and pick the, pick one of these. We'll, we'll stick with, um, uh, let's see. So you could, you, you can, you can barely see, I'm going to turn up the, I'm going to do a quick auto so you can maybe see this a little bit better. See some of the colors as, as we look at this. So you can see, uh, as, as we look at the different color swap options, you can see the different results. So hue uh, gives you a little, kind of a little bit of a purple sky. Invert is a little bit brighter of a sky. A red and blue channel swap gives a magenta, magenta, teal sky. <laughs> get my colors right today, a teal sky with a hint of color in, in the trees. And this tree almost has a, um, it's probably like an oak tree, but it almost has have kind of a cherry blossom feel. Sometimes you get that feel with infrared. Um, a shifting red and blue swap when shifting the green channel to the blue channel gives us this purple sky and um, uh, yellow foliage. 
Uh, if we shift if to red, now we're getting more of that sort of cherry blossom look with the teal sky and, and pink. And then the red-blue swap, but then splitting the green channel to each the red and blue gives us sort of a more traditional look. So let's go with this, uh, let's go with this more colorful uh, rendition here. And let me spend a little bit more time in some masks on this one. So the first thing that I'll do, and this is going to be tricky because the masks can be difficult. We'll do a quick sky, see how that works. But the, the masks can be a little bit difficult with uh, trees like this. So this is something you got to, and, and, and you can see it right here. So doing a, a sky selection is going to be tough because you're going to have to get in all these nooks and crannies and then brushing this, eh, uh, that's, that's, that's not for me. <laughs> that's too much work. Um, so I'm going to, let me delete this. Let's try something new. Let's try a, uh, a range mask and a color range. Now this is, this is nice in infrared because you have, uh, these, uh, distinct color separations between, uh, the, the, the two different primary, like primary colors, the sky and the foliage. So, but, but as you can see, it kind of, this green kind of bleeds everywhere. So I'm going to have to really refine this down. You can see it gets a, it gets a little bit better, but you can kind of see, oops, I can see a little dust spot there. You can kind of see, uh, how, some of the challenges here in, in working with a sky like this. So let's take something like this and then I'll just make some slight adjustments to the sky. Uh, we'll just up the saturation slightly cause I love this. I love me some teal sky. Um, and then maybe go down to a little bit of dehaze to just darken it up a smidge. Got to be careful with that one. Okay. So that is good for the sky. Now we get to the, uh, uh the foliage, which again is going to be kind of challenging because of this. So let's, but let's try another color range and see what that will do for us. So we'll pick up a color range here and I'm going to just pick the grass here see what that does. And again, it's going to grab a lot, uh, but we can use the refine option to try to slim this down a bit. And if I just, well, if I just take it all the way down, you can see actually it does a pretty good job of getting rid of most of the sky. Um, okay. So let's, let's work with that. Uh, so here, um, we could do a little bit more saturation. I'm going to come down and I'm going to actually add now that we have the, the, the curves in masks, which I love is awesome. We can add a little bit more contrast in curves, or you could even, you know, do a whole lot more in there, but I like this contrast. Let's now look at that negative clarity. Let's try that now that we're masking on just, um, the, uh, this color and see what we, what we get from there. We can get a little bit of a a softness that's going to come out of the trees. So I kind of like that. And the other thing I might do is I might, um, mask out the road, for example. So I could go to this mask and I could say subtract brush. So I'm going to, I'm going to subtract from what's masked and I would brush out the road and spending more time to do that. You see, if I show overlay, uh, let's see here. I want the flow to be a hundred. So I'm fully brushing it out and there you can see I'm I'm now masking out the road. So typically in an image like this I would probably try to separate out a path or a road from uh from the foliage and spend some time. I'll just do it super quick here, but to 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 separate that out. Okay, then we'll turn off the overlay and then now now the changes that I'm making will not apply to the road. And sometimes I might actually do a separate mask for just the road uh to kind of create some some more contrast there or darken it. If I want that to be, you know, a really strong, you know, um, strong contrast from the rest of the image. Okay. So let's see. It looks pretty good. We've got some softness in this color. I like the sky. I kind of like the direction this is going in. If I was to spend more time on this image, I would probably focus on the road, create a mask for that, darken it up a bit. Um, I might think about a crop. Do it. Do I want to lose maybe, you know, in an image like this, I might lose a little bit of the bottom, but that's okay. So this is pretty good. All right. So now let's compare this, uh, with the version that Andrew did and see how that looks. So I'll hit C and let me now I have to find the right image. Okay. All right. So, so here, this is a, this is a great example of, of different, you know, the different styles that could come out of something like this, because the version that Andrew did is, is really took the, 
the blooming of the highlights to a whole nother level. It's, it creates this whole sort of dreamy look that I really like. So uh, a little blown out, but again, that's okay if it creates the impression that you're trying to create. Uh, you can see that it it almost looks like the the blooming is really on the highlight. So he might have taken some uh, maybe maybe a this could have been not just a color, but could have been like a luminance mask to to bloom these out, or even even done in Photoshop. But again, this creates you know the the one that I have kind of is the basic kind of your basic edit, but this gets to the what I consider to be sort of the the next impressionist level what's the mood that i want to create so so i mean sometimes you want to create a mood where the highlights are blown out um and that's okay um and so that's a that's a style stylistic choice uh that you make and so i think that it's great i so i really like this rendition um the um uh, i think it's got a lot of impact it's got a lot of impact so excellent job with this image uh let's see so thank you thank you andrew for submitting these images uh, very nice, very nice work. All right. So let me, uh, take a look at, uh, the chat and catch up and see where we're at. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, I couldn't submit a file, tried multiple times. Oh, that's a bummer. Um, yeah. So the, 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 sub, the way to submit images for this is the, um, I'll just pull it up here briefly uh, and talk and talk about it. You can use this link at the bottom, which is the uh, 590.red slash live, which will take you to um, the the web page where I track the live stuff. And there's a link there where you can use to submit images. So if you want to submit anything, I don't know if we'll get to it today, but that's the that's the place where you would submit stuff. Um, let's see. Are there advantages, uh, Stuart says, are, are there advantages to using an 850 nanometer filter on a full spectrum converted camera for black and white? Um, so I guess compared to what? I mean, so so the when you put an 850 nanometer filter on either a full spectrum camera or a, even a camera that's been converted to, say, 720, 590, 470, whatever, um, you're basically going to end up with a... Uh, a, a monochrome image of infrared light only because infrared light starts at about 750 nanometers up. So um, you, you should get a very clean image with a converted camera of any kind, including full spectrum and an 850. Um, I guess uh, it depends on what you mean by the, the advantages. I think, I mean, I shoot a lot that way. I, sh I, I take converted cameras, either full spectrum or say a 590, and I will apply an 830 or an 850 nanometer filter to it. Uh, and you get very clean images uh, with that. Um, so I, I really like the, the results from that. Um, if, you, if you put a, an 800 plus filter on an unconverted camera, you could still get good results, but you're, it's going to be like a five minute exposure. Um, and so that's, that can be a little bit challenging. Uh, you definitely need a tripod and some patience for that. Um, how do you make, uh, Lane says, how do you make a camera profile now that Adobe no longer has the DNG editor? Well, so they sort of, I think they have it. So the, 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 the reason that I created the infrared profile pack is because of two problems. Number one, Whenever Adobe would update their support site, all the links to the DNG profile editor would break and people couldn't find it. Um, I didn't want to distribute that software because it's it's Adobe's. It's not mine to distribute, even though I have copies for both Windows and Mac. But I wanted to a solution so that people could keep shooting. So that's why we have the infrared profile pack that gets us over this hurdle of being able to create uh, profiles that cover the, the most basics, the most common scenarios for infrared. Um the the other challenge, of course, is that Adobe doesn't update this software very frequently. This version, I think, is like what twelve years old or something. Um, so the the DNG profile editor doesn't get updated very often. And in fact, um, it can be challenging. You, you kind of have a similar problem. There's another piece of software called the um, DNG converter that Adobe puts out to convert raw files to DNG files. And even that piece of software doesn't get updated very frequently. And as a result, there's a lot of 
raw files from newer cameras that cannot be converted to DNG. And then I have to go into Lightroom to convert those to DNG. So there's definitely a challenge with Adobe not supporting and updating these um, utility programs, if you will. Um, and so I have links on my website in the, if you go to my website, my blog, um, and which is, you can get to it 590.red slash blog. If you go to, to my website there and go to the downloads page at the bottom of that page, there's a section called third party downloads. And I'm always trying to keep a link to, uh, the latest downloads for those Adobe programs, even if they move around, they, they, I haven't checked recently to see if they're broken, but I try to keep them updated, uh, to make sure that they link to the greatest, the latest now the, and then there's another problem even is that, um, some, some of the security settings on Mac and windows will try to block you from installing the software, uh, sometimes more aggressively than others. And you can get around that, but if you're not technically proficient in understanding how to do that, then that can be challenging. So there's, there's just all these blocks that, that are there. Um, but it's challenging, you know, Adobe's trying to like, I, I I'm sure that they're trying to invest their product and engineering time into, uh, the, the things that they think are going to generate revenue. Um, and sometimes these older utility programs get, uh, lost in the dust as a result of that. Um, so, but I want to make sure that for infrared photographers, we have access to these tools or at least the profiles that'll help us, uh, to be successful with infrared. And we're not, we're not blocked by that. Um, dream world images says for skies, I do the color range and add multiple ranges to get all the skies refined as I go. Yeah, absolutely. So if you, if you spend, um, if you do a lot of time, uh, masking, you, you get to learn, uh, the, that you can, you can do the additive and subtractive and you can use things like color range and luminance and select sky and all of these things in the mask to really refine. And the mask you get is going to depend upon, uh, how complex the edges are that you have, but the masking tools that uh, have come out in Lightroom in the last year have been fantastic. So they're uh, a big help and allow us to do things in Lightroom that would have been uh, limited to Photoshop in the past. So that's absolutely fantastic. Uh, let's see, planning to convert my X-T2 this month. I might go with the IR Chrome filter since I'm not so familiar with editing great videos. So, um, I, I really like the IR Chrome filter. I don't know if you could, if you can convert a camera to IR Chrome, I guess you could do that. I might be reluctant to do that. And the only reason being is that it's, it's, it, it really limits you to just shooting that filter only. I, I guess technically you could, you could probably shoot, you could put a 720 or an 830 filter on it and shoot those as well. But it, it's very limiting. Um, most, most of the times, if you want to shoot IR Chrome, you'll convert to full spectrum and use that as an external filter. That's typically what happens. Um, okay, so let let me move on. Let me find the next um, uh, thing that I have queued up. Uh, so this is an image from Pavel. So let me find this image. And then I'll get sharing and we'll talk about that. Get refreshed here on whether this is a already edited image or if this was a raw let's see here okay here we go all right let me go into the develop module in lightroom and i will develop let me reset this back to the beginning okay and then i'll share my screen here oops Wrong, wrong, wrong screen, wrong screen. All right, here we go. That's better. The, the control room. There was a malfunction in the control room. Um, I'm going I'm to have to talk to those people about that. Okay, so uh, let's look at this image here. And um, uh, again, we will have a, uh, we'll have to set a profile here. Uh, I'll start with 50. And I like to white balance on, inanimate objects like granite. Cause I think they tend to give me a really good balance here. Although with this image, this is probably, um, something, this isn't like super colorful. So I'm thinking it's about, it's a, it's a 720 as well. I could also white balance in the tree here. And you can see there's just not a ton of difference between sort of the granite here and the tree, the tree. If I white balance on this object, I get a little bit of blue, a hint of blue, but not a ton. 
In effect, I'm very low in the range. I might even go to 100 just to be sure here. Give me, gives me a little more breathing room if I wanted to drag this around back and forth. So, but for now, let me just pick this. And so, so with any given image, you know, I, I will say that I, I tend to color swap most of my images, but I don't necessarily, you don't have to. Um, so it's just, it's an entirely optional thing. And in fact, images that don't have as much of a sky, this has got a little bit of a sky, but images that don't have a lot of sky, you may ha see a limited advantage or, or even images that have, that are fully overcast. Um, there's less need, you're not gonna have a blue sky anyway. So there may be less of a need to, to swap colors. Um, so I can look at some of the options that are here. Oh, let's see. And again, for me, I know that there's these are there's all these different techniques, but one of the things that I like about having these in Lightroom and having these previews is that I can then look at the mood that each color profile creates and cr try to decide if it's if that is if it's saying anything to me, if it speaks to me um, in a way that that uh, that is meaningful. So uh, you know, I like I like the contrast coming out of this invert, and none of these other colors are sort of speaking to me. So let's just go, let's go with that. Um, now this, this might be, you know, there's, oops, there's some kind of softness here. I'm trying to see, this is 30 seconds. So this, this is probably an unconverted camera uh, with a 720 nanometer filter. Um, and I can, there might be a little bit of a, might be a little bit of a breeze that was blowing that day because you can see the trees are moving here. Um, and, so, so something to keep not, and that's fine. Not, not, not a, not a challenge, um, but something to be aware of if you have a longer exposure, um, you know, sometimes you're going to, uh, you're going to have some elements that, that will not, that, that will be rock solid and some that will not. Now, I also might say, I think the focus is just a hair off in this, and that's definitely challenging for, with an unconverted camera. One of the things that I'll do if I'm shooting with a, with an unconverted camera, sometimes the the filter can make it really hard to see the image and make sure you have an accurate focus. Sometimes the autofocus won't work. So one of the things that I that I will do, you don't want to focus without the filter, because if you focus without the filter, then you will the focus will not be accurate because focus light focuses in a different plane of visible compared to infrared. So you don't want to focus without the filter. You'll be it'll be off. You want to focus with the filter. And what I'll do is I'll just crank the ISO up. Uh, on the camera to the point, even if it's like super noisy, but if it allows me to then punch in and see a good focus or use focus peaking to then see a good focus and then set my focus, then I'll turn the ISO back down to my lowest level. Uh, and that'll ensure that I get a sharp image uh, when even when I'm shooting with an unconverted camera. So something to keep in mind. Um, okay, so let's get back into editing this. So let's uh, look at the some masks, and uh, out of curiosity, let's see what a select subject does. You never know. You never know with AI, AI these days. Uh, somebody said, what are your thoughts on the Calari IR software? I think it's called Clear. Um, I have not used the software, so I cannot offer uh, specific advice on it. Um, I know that it is, I know that it, um, uh, it contains a, a Photoshop panel, uh, that, that has a number of features for infrared. Um, and I know that they've started doing um, color swap profiles for Lightroom, uh, much like the ones that I have. Um, and then of course they have video training, but I, but I have not used it, so I really cannot offer a specific recommendation. So this, um, the subject here does a pretty good job, but you might, if you might wanna do add to this and maybe take a brush and come in here and, you know, add to the base more and you know do it pretty precisely more precisely than i'm doing here i'm just going to do it sort of quickly here um and that kind of helps me cover this because what i what i like to do in an image like this is i like to i like to use sharpness to create contrast between the the subject and the background so i'll take a subject like this and i will increase the contrast i will probably even do a curve to increase the contrast and probably do some dehaze and clarity and texture and all that kind of stuff to, 
to really make that punch. And then, and then that becomes sort of the focus of the image once I, once I get this down. Then what I'll typically do is I will, uh, depending on the image, but in this image, I think I can do a duplicate and invert, which will give me a mask of everything but the subject. Uh, and you can see my edges aren't super clean here. I could probably, you, you might want to clean up your edges as much as you can before you do that, but that's okay. Um, so for this image, I've duplicated it inverted. And uh, now that I've done that, now I can treat the, the foliage differently. So I can make it a little softer. So I, I could go into clarity um, and I could maybe soften that up a bit. And again, we've already got some of the motion blur from the trees, so not a big deal there. Um, and we could we could do some different treatments. Uh, you might you, you can you can go crazy with this, but you you're probably better off with something more subtle in the you know twenty to thirty range ish uh, thereabouts to to create some contrast. Um, and in an image like this, you know, there's not a lot of there's just not a lot of color here. The other thing you could think about would be to to go monochrome or or to desaturate an image. A lot of times I will, sometimes I'll go outright monochrome and say, you know what, I just want to switch to black and white and see what that does. And, and that's definitely more punchy. So, so that's one option. Um, the other option would be that I might take an image like this and just go down to saturation and just desaturate it, uh, the whole image. So I get a little bit of, a, I get these hints of color in the image. Um, it's almost like a, I almost think of it as like a hybrid of a, of a color and a monochrome image. You're getting, you're trying to get some of that punchy high contrast from a monochrome image, but you're going to leave a little subtle amount of color like you might see in a, in a sepia tone or, a, or some other kind of uh, color toned, uh, uh, split toned type image. Um, so that's what I would do in an image like this is, is focus on separating out the subject from the rest of it. Um, but again, uh, I would be careful about uh, the, the motion blur is fine. That doesn't bother me, but, uh, be careful focus when you're shooting unconverted because that can be definitely very tricky. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Um, I've noticed that my GoPro is sensitive to IR and tested it. Um, oh, that'll be interesting. I'd be curious. Um, I think you can shoot raw. I, I have a GoPro, but I haven't used it in a long time. So I'm trying to remember if you can shoot raw with it in addition to JPEG. I don't know. Um, that would be interesting. Um, once you've set the contrast slider, is it then adding a, is the contrast curve additive? Yes. Uh, so for me, and I did a whole video on contrast, but I'll give you the, I'll give you the quick version. There's a whole bunch of ways to add contrast to an image and they are all additive. So they will all add on top of each other. So one of them is to use the contrast slider. Um, and again, I'm, I'm here in the basic panel. So the changes I'm making here will be global. Uh, so you could use the contrast slider. You can use uh, clarity and dehaze. Clarity, uh, it's like a micro contrast that it will add to an image. Um, and so keep in mind there. Dehaze is intended to cut the haze for items in the uh, objects in the distance, but it, it actually creates a strong amount of contrast. So in fact, you could see really, really strong. I tend to Unless there's something very specific that I'm doing, I tend to try to keep the de the amount of dehaze that I use for adding contrast to a very, very small amount. Um, and then tone curve is another way you can add contrast. You can either use one of these uh, presets, the medium contrast or the strong contrast, or you can uh, go in and manually, uh, you, can, you can either manually adjust these, these points, or I could use this picker here to, to pick something and, and I can also use the picker to identify. So if you look, I'm going to zoom in here for a second so you can kind of see this on the right. So if I have this picker selected here and I roll over parts of the image, you can see that there's a, a gray dot that'll show the part that I'm doing. So then I could either click to add another dot or I could just grab, I could say, oh, that's well, giving me close to this dot. I could then start to make adjustments to that. Uh, to get the look that I want. So you could, you could uh, work this even more. A lot of times I will, um, if I, if I'm, uh, there's some images where uh, the, 
most images where I'm, I'm dealing with the tone curve, I'm just doing an S curve. I'm just accepting one of the defaults, but occasionally I'll get an image, particularly in black and white that has some particular challenges in the tonality. And I might get more granular in putting points in and trying to drag those around to create contrast. So those are the main, the main ways that you can create con contrast. The other, the other way you can actually create, you can actually create contrast with color as well. Um, by, by doing split toning or color grading. So I could apply, say, um, a, uh, some say like a yellow or an orange color to the highlights and a blue color to the shadows that would create a, a sense of contrast through color, excuse me, or you can create contrast like I did with these masks by, by a sense of sharpness. So there's all kinds of ways to create, to create contrast in your images. Okay. Um, all right, let's see. Let me move on here to the next uh, submission that I have. And let me get my transition right this time. Okay. So let's see here. Next up. Uh, so that is, let's see. Cover that. Uh, next up is a question uh, from Luke. Um, and this question is, what is the best editing application for IR for desktop and iPad? Thanks, Luke. That is a loaded question, Luke. <laughs> um, when I got started in infrared, this was the, the kind of the question that I had. And, and if you look at the, the, my video history, you'll find probably two dozen videos that try to answer this question because I, I looked at, I looked at at least, I don't know, more than a dozen editors, uh, to try to answer this question and say, what, it, what was the best tool for editing? And, um, I guess the first thing that I'll say is there is no one best tool. It's, this is very, this is a very subjective space. I can't sit here and say that raw editor A is better than raw editor B. I think, I think it's very subjective. I'll tell you what my opinions are. Um, but I'll also tell you things that are, um, that are, that work for, uh, other people, depending on some of the constraints that they have. So I've got a whole playlist on YouTube that is nothing but infrared editors. There's probably 20 videos in there. So if you really want to deep dive and want to see all of that, you can go look at that. I'll give you the highlights. So the most powerful editor for infrared, I think is Photoshop. Uh, Photoshop gives you the most, uh, capabilities, but it is not the fastest and it is complex and it has a high learning curve. I, my preferred editor is Lightroom Classic because it is a good combination of speed and functionality. It doesn't give me everything that I need, but it gives me the vast majority of what I need. Uh, and especially with the new masking tools, I think that they, they've reduced my need to go to Photoshop dramatically. So I really like Lightroom Classic. Now, the challenge with that is that when you get to the the cloud stuff, you've got to be aware of how the syncing works with collections to make sure that you could, if you want to use uh, Lightroom on the iPad. And that's what I use um, uh, on the iPad when I'm mobile um, or when I'm on a laptop or something. I will use, uh, I will, I will use my synced collections and open up Lightroom to be able to edit mobily. In fact, one of the workflows that I, that I use most commonly is to go into Lightroom Classic, import all of my images and and then sync them to a collection, which, which then syncs to the cloud. And then sometimes I'll just use my iPad to do my initial culling, you know, so I'll do ratings, um, accept, reject, um, you know, star ratings to see which ones I want to work on. Maybe I'll do a profile and a quick edit and I'll do some light editing on the iPad and I'll do this, that first couple passes on the iPad. And then, which is nice because I could do it on my couch. I could do it while I'm traveling. I can do it. Uh, in a variety of places. And then those changes sync back to Lightroom Classic. And then I'll probably do my final edits in Lightroom Classic, especially if it's an image I want to spend more time on. So that's the workflow I like there. Um, but not everybody likes the Adobe products. Not everybody likes the, the cost of the subscriptions. Um, one of the other tools that uh, is has similar capabilities, uh, but it costs less is on one. I think is a great editor. Um, Capture One is a great editor for visible light, but it's not a great editor for infrared, so that can be challenging. Um, if we look at the uh, more towards the iPad, probably my my favorite 
uh, editor for the iPad is going to be Photomator, used to be Pixelmator. Uh, the interface is great. It works well with infrared. Um, uh, and I just, I really like the capabilities of that, uh, about that editor. It's just got a, a super easy to use interface. And then there's a, uh, a pro version, but it's for Macs only. So if you're on a Mac, um, uh, you know, a MacBook pro or uh, a Mac desktop, whatever you could use that combination. You could use uh, Photomator pro for the desktop or the laptop, and then you could use the Photomator, uh, there's a, a different version that is for uh, the iPad and even the iPhone. Um, so that's 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 a good if you're in the Mac ecosystem. If you are trying to go really um, low cost, then there's some good open source options that are available for you. Specifically, Darktable and Raw Therapy are both really good, excellent editors that produce great output. They're open source, so they're free. Uh, the interface can be a little bit more complicated and there might be a little bit more to learn that's sort of the price you have to pay uh for going free but they're actually great tools uh and they produce great images so it's it, it's a challenging space because um not only do you have the trying to find tools that work well with infrared which is not easy as we know i mean even the adobe products you have the challenges with the profiles and stuff um but you so you have this 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 complex six dimensional matrix of like, I want something that works well with infrared. I want something that has a good cataloging system. That's, I mean, that's one of my preferences. Um, I don't want to be opening up every image that I shoot in Photoshop. So I want good cataloging. Um, I want a good editing tool that has good editing capabilities. I want to be able to sync to, uh, a tablet. And so you start to add in all of these factors and it really limits the amount of choices you have, which is why I tend to spend most of my time in the Adobe ecosystem because it has most of that. It's not perfect. Um, it's not even cheap, uh, but it covers my bases and it, it's, it, I think it makes me the most productive. And when I think about comparing the value of my time to the cost, then it's worth the cost. Um, you know, especially the $10 plan, the $10 a month plan from Adobe. Now the $50 a month plan, that <laughs> that's probably more designed for businesses. That's not worth my, my money, but the $10 a month plan, it, it, it increases my productivity enough that I think it's worth it. And I don't mind spending the money. Um, so that's my, that's my relatively short answer to what's the best editor. But again, if you have questions about any individual, uh, tool, raw editor, go look at some of those videos and hopefully that'll answer a lot of your questions. Uh, let's see here. Um, uh, thanks for your Fuji lens test video. Uh, excellent. Yep. Oh, excellent. The hotspots. Yeah. Hotspots are challenging. So that's good. I'm glad it helped there, Joe. Um, affinity photo can be used for IR. I, I really like affinity photo. That is a, as an, as a raw editor, affinity photo is a really nice tool, but again, it's the challenge that I personally have with it is this is the fact that it lacks that ecosystem and it doesn't have some of those other capabilities, but as a, as a raw editor, affinity photo is great. Um, let's see. Uh, dark table is fantastic. Once you, yep. I dark table is really good. If I was, um, um, <laughs> a broke photographer, I would use dark table. Uh, it's, it's a really great tool. It, it, it has a learning curve, but once you get used to it, then, um, uh, then it's totally, it's, it's, it's totally fine. Okay. Let's get into some more images. Um, let's see. Oh, this is, a, well, this is actually a question. Uh, this is a, this is a, an interesting question. Um, and, uh, so let's dive in. The question is from Marge and it is, are there any special techniques that I should know for infrared flower photography? So this is fascinating because this is kind of a challenging space. And let's talk about some of the options. Let's talk about what doesn't work first. Um, and then we could talk about what does work. So let me, let me pull up um, some examples of flower photography that I've shot in infrared. We'll start with, we'll start with the, the, the sort of what doesn't work. Um, so let me, let me share this here. So this is an example of a lovely, beautiful, colorful floral arrangement, uh, that existed here that I shot in infrared. Um, you may notice that it doesn't look colorful. <laughs> and, and this is the challenge with, uh, with infrared is that 
these um the because the greens reflect so much this is this is monochrome let me get back to a a raw version so you can kind of see the 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 reality of what i'm talking about here still not much not much difference uh so this is this is uh actually the color version of this so this was shot with a uh, i believe a 590 maybe 720 nanometer filter but again even if i crank up the saturation you're just not much color here so this is the challenge with with infrared especially typical infrared like 590 720 uh etc um even 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 into the orange filter there's the problem is is that the green in infrared is going to reflect so much infrared light that it interferes with the colors if i zoom in here you can start to see a little bit of a difference you can see the flowers are a little bit white and then the the uh, you know the, the base of the plant that would normally be green is a little bit blue but it's not super interesting right there's just not much going on there so the 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 whiteness that's coming off of of these um uh of the green uh the chlorophyll parts of the plant is just making this uninteresting so if in fact if i go to this next image this is like the same thing. This was a, uh, this is a fisheye lens. This was like this beautiful uh, plant of tulips. I knew it was going to turn out this way. So this was, this was, there was no surprises here for me. Um, but, but uh, let's see here. So let me get, again, get back to color. So a color version and I'll zoom in a little bit. And again, you can see this challenge where the flowers, which were a whole variety of colors, um, uh, would be uh, would just be white, and then there's just a hint of this like, like soft blue that exists here. So, I would say that your your typical traditional infrared photography of like a 720 or a 590, probably even higher, the into the into the infrared only is probably going to be a bust for uh, flowers. Now, there is an infrared filter that kind of looks okay. Um, and that is the IR Chrome filter. So this is one I shot just last week on a trip. Um, and you can see that with the IR Chrome filter, a little bit more of the variation gets retained. You have the, the green foliage turns orange, but because of the nature of the filter and because it's pulling in some blues and things, you're getting a little bit more variety in the other colors. Um, and so those are kind of retained. You see, we have these whites and pinks and reds uh, and different variations. So one of the things that you could do to shoot flowers in infrared is try the IR chrome filter. Um, this would be a good approach. Now, the other thing that you could do, and that's probably the best you're going to get from infrared, unless, I mean, again, some very, maybe there's some black and white things you could do, maybe with an 800 filter, but you'd have to really play with the contrast. It's going to be challenging. It's really going to depend on the subject and the lighting and all kinds of stuff. Um, so you can do flower photography and infrared. It is challenging. Now, the area that's more interesting is probably ultraviolet. So at the ultraviolet end of the spectrum, you have um, a lot of really interesting things you could look at. And so uh, what's what's unique about ultraviolet photography, and I don't have a ton of, in fact, I don't even think I have any, um, no, I don't even have any, any ultraviolet stuff to share. Um, one of the challenges, uh, I haven't shot a ton of, of ultraviolet. I've, I've mostly done people, but ultraviolet flower photography is interesting. Uh, the, bec and the reason is, is because there are patterns in the flowers that you can't see with your visible eye, and that could be really interesting. The other thing that is, uh, really interesting in ultraviolet is something called um, uh, UV induced fluorescence. And this is where you're using, um, I'm not an expert in this either, but this is an area where you're using, I believe, ultraviolet lights to induce a fluorescent effect in a, in a plant that then is captured in visible light. So it's a I think it's more visible light photography, but it's using an infrared lighting technique. But again, those, if you Google that, if you just Google um, uh, UVIF um, and take a look there uh, and look at the, the images that are available, you'll see really stunning images. So if you're looking for the most sort of 
um, impactful sort of stunning images that you could get with flowers, you're probably going to want to lean towards ultraviolet, either straight up ultraviolet with a, with an ultraviolet bandpass filter that blocks out visible light and allows ultraviolet in, or maybe some combination of full spectrum ultraviolet, um, or you're going to want to look into uh, UV IF. Those are definitely the, the best options you're going to have. Um, I, I guess the other, the one other th filter that I've seen uh, for infrared that people use is maybe like a 470, 470 nanometer. But then that, that filter is allowing in um, blue, green, yellow, orange, red, and infrared light. So it's, it's allowing a lot of light in and then it's just cutting off the indigo, the violet, and the ultraviolet. So if you really want to try uh, flower photography with, with um, infrared, I would suggest look at the a 470 filter or look at an IR chrome filter because those are allowing some blues in that make it more interesting. Otherwise, take a look at ultraviolet um, and uh, that's gonna, that could produce really a little bit a little bit different equipment and setup. Um, although you might need, you, you may still need a full spectrum camera. You'll need a full spectrum camera for a UV band pass. Um, and, uh, but if you go with the, uh, UVIF, you're probably going to need some lights to support that. Uh, let's see here. Let me check out the comments and see where we're at. Um, uh, with IR Chrome, I think it's a mix of how much visible light passes and a slight reduction in IR transmission compared to the usual. I did a test on IR Chrome and a very non-scientific test, and it, and it seemed to me that IR Chrome was passing um, 720 and up uh, light, so like a typical 720 nanometer filter, but it was also passing a range of blue, so from like, I don't know, 470, I forget the exact range, but basically blue light. So it was allowing blue light to pass, and then it was allowing that to pass. And the combination of those two, I think, is what creates the really interesting effects with IR Chrome. Uh, let's see. Full spectrum flowers can look cool. So yeah, maybe try. I would try full spectrum. That could be another another thing to check. I'm always, I haven't, it's on my, my backlog of things to do, is to try to find good things to do with full spectrum. And I, that, that might be a good one because I have, I have yet to find too many other, um, Full spectrum is not great for a lot of things, um, but maybe it would be good for, for flowers. So that would be a good one to try. Um, let's see. Susan said uh, UVIF is challenging. Uh, I can definitely imagine that. Focusing is difficult. I, oh boy, I, I could probably appreciate that. Um, and lenses. Oh, that's, an, that's another thing to bring up if you're thinking about UV is you know how with infrared, you need lenses that don't have hot spots. Uh, with UV, there's you also have lens restrictions, but they're different in the fact that you're looking for lenses and lens coatings that transmit more UV light. So it's very particular about uh, UV photography is very particular about the kind of lenses you can use, or at least it it affects the transmission of light. So I, I did some UV photography, and I've actually bought. I bought a Russian lens that's supposed to be really good for transmitting UV light, but then it was a terrible pain trying to get a, a filter adapter for it um, that actually fit. Uh, I think I finally got that, so I've got to go back and test that at some point. I want to try a variety of filters and see how they, a variety of lenses and see how they work with with ultraviolet. But it's definitely challenging to to find lenses that are good for UV. Um, uh, Phil says I should do. Uh, do a show on UV setup and editing. So I did. I did one. Um, I did one uh, UV video uh, that was primarily focused on portraiture of people, uh, like close-ups of faces, and I was really happy with the results. I like to do more flowers and other things. I think I've, uh, I think I've burned out my family <laughs> and my extended family on uh, capturing them uh, without telling them what I'm doing. Portraits of them without just stand here and let me take a photo of you, and I'm not going to tell you why. Um, uh, but flowers are of course more forgiving than my family. So I may, I may try that at some point in the future. Um, is full spectrum better suited for astrophotography or is IR better, uh, from, uh, Eric. So let's see, there's, um, this is, a, a there's, there's a, 
I'm trying to think of the ways to answer this. So the, there's, there's a, a variety of things that you can do with astrophotography. I would say that if you are shooting the Milky Way, then I would think it would be really interesting to try, um, um, to try uh, full spectrum and see what that looks like. I think you'd get more, especially more of the violets that come out of the, uh, uh, and the, the ultraviolet uh, light could be interesting because because uh, uh, when I've done Milky Way photography, typically I, I can amp up some of the stuff at the violet end of the spectrum and it looks really nice. So I think full spectrum would be a really interesting way to test that out and see how that looks. But if you're if you're doing anything more specific, people tend to gravitate towards the narrow band filters. So uh, an H alpha filter or an oxygen or a sul sulfur filter or a dual band. I've got a I've got a dual band filter that I think passes both light at the um, uh, H alpha wavelength and the oxygen wavelength. So uh, if you're trying to really limit both pol light pollution from Earth um, and and hone in on a narrow band, then some of those filters can be really interesting. But IR in and of itself, um, if you do, if you were to say, so so the, the H alpha is like what, 656 nanometers, I think. So if you were to, to do a, like a 590 filter, you might kind of, it's not narrow band, of course, but you'd be filtering out potentially any light pollution that's coming from below 590. Um, so there, you, there might be a benefit to that, but I think you'd probably get better results just with a straight, uh, uh, H alpha filter. So I want to do more. Um, I've done a little bit of, um, of testing with, with infrared in terms of like a 590, but I did, I do have this dual band filter that I want to try, um, that I have yet to use that I think would be really interesting for, um, for Astro. And I want to do more multi-spectral photography where I'm, t where I'm shooting multiple images in different spectrum, uh, and then combining them together in post-production and Astro is definitely an area where you could benefit from that. I want to try that terrestri terrestrially as well, but, but Astro is an area where I want to try that. Um, and I want to learn more, but, but I think that it just depends on what you're shooting, uh, Milky Way wide angle. I think, uh, full spectrum could be very interesting, but the more, uh, the longer lens you're shooting, the more narrow your subject of Astro, I think you're going to want to lean more towards a, a narrow band filter. Uh, let's see. Oh, so, and Phil's got some good, good feedback on, on Astro as well, saying that nebulas, nebulas are excellent for full spectrum, but planets and cluster type targets aren't as rewarding. So yeah, it, it, it very much depends upon, uh, what you're shooting. Um, <laughs> People low-key have a tendency to get insulted when you take pictures of them in UV. Um, yes, like my in-laws. <laughs> who, I, who the, it ranged from, wow, that makes me look so, like, rugged and sophisticated to, oh my gosh, you made me look like I'm 100 years old. Um, <laughs> so I'm still, I'm still dealing with the fallout from that one. All right, so uh, let's see here. So that was, that, that, that was... Uh, we talked about flower photography. We talked about um, astro a little bit. Okay, let's move on to uh, some other images to edit. Um, this is from Patrick. Hi, I'm new to IR. I've uploaded uh, NEF file uh, for the live stream. I use an unconverted camera, a D Nikon D850 with a Hoya R72. I have the uh, the temperature adjustments and the color swaps. I'm still trying to process the images with some success. Please, if you could use the file, I'd love to get your input, Patrick. Okay, Patrick, let's take a look at your images. Let me find these. Uh, here we go. So I've got a picture. I've got a RAW from Patrick, and then I have a, uh, a JPEG. So we'll, we'll start with the RAW, uh, and then we will uh, we'll work our way over to the JPEG and compare the results uh, after. So let me switch over here to looking at this and let's, all right, let's get started. So of course we're going to need a profile, uh, to get started here. I'll start with a negative 50. This is kind of a, looks like a bit of an underexposed image. Uh, we've got some nice clouds here so I can, I'll pick the clouds. Let me just do a quick auto here to kind of get, get the, this up to a good spot. This is like, you could see. If you look over here on the right, you can see this is about two stops underexposed. That's it's, and that's definitely challenging with 
this is not a knock uh, against you, Patrick. Uh, that's challenging to get the, the exposure right with an unconverted camera. Um, I'm frequently off by a stop. So, um, uh, but 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 you fortunately there's enough latitude in in modern cameras to be able to pull up two stops and still have really nice really nice detail here. Um, I really love in this particular image. I love the contrast between the what the long exposure does uh, to to smooth out the water and the nice sharp plant life. I think that looks really nice. When it, there, there, there's definitely, you know, I have a bunch of converted cameras and every once in a while I will shoot unconverted because there's a certain, there's a certain quality that you can get from unconverted. Yeah, you could add neutral density filters and stuff, but there's definitely a quality you get from uh, uh, shooting with an unconverted camera that I think can be really magical at times. So, uh, let's see here. So we've got this real, I just love this foreground here between the water, um, and the plants. This is, this is very, very nice. So, uh, as, as is always, I'm faced with my first dilemma. Do I want to color swap or not with it, with this image? So I've got a pretty good white balance. Cause again, it was white balancing on the clouds. So we know that the clouds are white. We've got a little bit of gold sky coming through. We have this kind of nice purple tone here. Uh, with the rest of the image. So let's look at some of the swaps and see, see what we get for colors. And you're the, the, one of the, one of the things you'll notice when shooting unconverted is that the colors can get a little weird, um, because, because it's unconverted, because you, you're, you're taking that, um, that Hoya R72, you're and using that to block visible light, but you've got the hot mirror in the camera, so you're you're gonna get some visible light. So this is not a this is not like a converted camera image where it's just purely the you know uh, you know red light and, and infrared light. You're gonna get some visible light, and that tends to muddy up the colors a little bit. That's okay. Um, it depends on the nature of the image, but but it it can also mean some of these swaps don't look great. <laughs> So some of these, some of the color combinations, so like a hue, meh, that doesn't look so good. Hue and invert don't look so good. Uh, the, a, a straight red blue channel mixer. That's interesting. I like the color of the foliage. The sky is a bit muted. Um, this one is always, well, it's not bad actually. Uh, it, it, it depends on where you want to kind of draw the attention to. Usually with the shifting green to blue, you get more purple in the sky, but this is not so much here. Uh, if I go down to shifting to red, this is really, uh, I, 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 I like this combination a lot, but maybe not so much for this image. And then here's a version that is kind of straight up, um, with the green split. And so you get this kind of a more muted colors in the foreground and, uh, kind of a nice muted sky. I'm going to, I'm going to pick this. We'll, we'll, we'll pick this one to do this edit. Um, and so now with an image like this, you know, it's, this is tricky because you don't have a, um, a, a, a straight up sky that you've got, you've got like the clouds, I guess is what I'm saying is the clouds are, um, obscuring most of the sky. So I don't know how much you want to get into say, trying to like de you could dehaze this a little bit, maybe pull a little bit more sky out. That might be an option. Um, and then if I look at the foreground, let me just do a reverse duplicate and invert that to get me everything else in the image or most of it. You can see there's some little bit of a uh, imperfections around the edge of the mask that could be cleaned up. Um, and I'm going to take this and I'm probably going to increase the contrast because I like, I like you me some contrast. Where's my curve? It's hidden. Um, add some contrast, kick that up. No. All right, there we go. Uh, maybe too much maybe a little more subtle for an image like this. So th that's another thing is you could use, uh, you could use a combination of things. Uh, if you, if you wanted to do negative clarity to, to add a little bit of a glow to the image, you could do that and still use other ways to add contrast. So the curve or a contrast slider could still get you, uh, could still get you some, some contrast that way. This is looking a little bit, Still a little dark for me. I'll probably pull it up just a little bit more. Another third of a stop or so. All right. So the other thing that 
you might notice in in this image and i don't know if this is i don't know that this is a hot spot or maybe it's a filter image but i'm seeing just a smidge of vignetting if i if i zoom out you can kind of see how it's darker along the right and darker along the left so one of the things that you could do is go down to uh where is it effects and you could look at a post crop vignette um and try to make an adjustment there but Oh, that's so like, even just a, a nudge there is already too much. Um, that doesn't work very well. So the other way you could do this is just with a mask. So I could create a, uh, a radial gradient and then draw a circle in the center, something like that, and then invert it because I only want to affect the outer edge. And then I could make adjustments to the outer edge. So maybe I could bring up the con, bring up the exposure slightly. It looks like it's more exposed. It also looks like it has maybe more saturation. So I could, if I want to, if I don't want the, the edges to be more saturated than the center, I could bring that down. So I could play with that to kind of, um, to kind of make an adjustment there, um, to kind of balance out the image. I'm also going to, I think I'm going to, I'm going to invert this as well and do another copy of this. And I think I'm going to bring up the saturation in the middle a little bit to kind of compensate for that. So um, something that you, you it, it's gonna depend on your lens and filter combination as to whether you're getting this kind of an effect, but, and it might, you might need to zoom out uh, to be able to see that, uh, but that looks a little bit better now. Okay, so let me turn this off and this is, a, well, let me, let me zoom back in. This is a good, good point where I, I like to step back and see what I wanna do with the image. Um, you, so another thing that you could do is you could really, I, I, I love this foreground so much Maybe I would come in and try to increase the some uh, clarity, um, some sh some sharpness with the foreground. So maybe kind of coming into this area. Um, I might come in here and just increase the clarity a bit. Try to draw the attention down here because I think this is a really nice part of this image. So that's the kind of thing that I would do. So this is this is, would be my 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 starter version of this. I might step back from it um, and come back to it. Maybe maybe add a little more contrast to this tree to kind of bring this out a little bit. It's kind of blending into the background a bit. So I might come in and and do a brush and and maybe punch maybe bring the exposure up or increase the sharpness of it with with contrast or texture. Um, so so that would be something that I would consider doing there. Okay, so let's take a look at. Uh, the version that um, Patrick did. So let me, uh, let, let's save you the trouble of, of watching me fumble around <laughs> trying to, to find the comparison. And I'll just pull it right up and then, and then we'll share. Uh, I think I'm going to get pretty close to it. Yep. All right. Here we go. All righty. So let me switch back. Okay. So uh, we have... Um, on the left, we have the version that I've edited, and then on, we have on, on the right, we have the version uh, that uh, Patrick edited. Um, and so, uh, again, this is a, another example of no right, no wrong. Uh, everybody, every, everybody has their own sort of sense of taste for this. Um, so uh, my version puts a little bit more emphasis on the sky, tries to bring out a little bit blue in the sky, although it might be a little noisier there as a result of that, and goes for a more subtle more subtle color. Um, whereas uh, Patrick's version is very focused on color and really trying to bring out this color. Um, and I love the, the actual color and the tone of this. Um, so that's, that's absolutely great. The only, the, the only thing I would say is if you look at the, um, the sky kind of up here, you're getting a little bit of red bleeding into the sky and these edges are very dark. And that might be a reason that might be, um, I might, without adjusting the color or other elements of this, I might do a mask to try to either lighten, bring up the exposure, or maybe reduce the saturation a little bit of the edges to try to bring it in line with the rest of the image. Otherwise, my eye tends to be drawn to the edges. Um, but but I think that the the middle of the image looks great. Um, you know, again, I love the the subject here. I love this color. So I think it's a, I think it's a great image. Um, and if, if, if my recommendation would be maybe just tweak the, tweak the edges a little bit, uh, but I love, love what you've done with it. So thank, thank you, Patrick, for sharing this image. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, let's see what we've got here going on in the chat. 
Um, let's see. Um, Cat, hey, Cat, how you doing? Uh, do you have any recommendations for removing color cast in Lightroom? When when you say color cast, um, uh, do you mean like a, a color, maybe a color temperature cast? Um, let me see. Let me see if I've got a. Let me look for an image uh, that I could that I could pull up uh, while thinking about that. I did a video um, that kind of addressed color casts. Um, I think it was called like triple white balance, or maybe that was the that was the thumbnail. But it talked about um, using using um, uh, different um, uh, using masks to remove a cast a color cast from different parts of an image. Um, so that could be one, or are you, or are you thinking about moving a, removing a color cast overall from the image? So let me ask you that. And if you could throw that in the chat, um, once you, once you, uh, get to that, once you hear that part, uh, and then let me, while I'm waiting for your answer there for more specifics, let me pull up, let me look at what's next here. Um, see how I'm doing on time. I gotta go faster. I gotta go faster. Gotta get through it. Gotta get through all the submissions. Uh, let's see. So let's let's take a look. Uh, uh, let, let me take a look at some uh, some images that were submitted from. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Frantisek um, submitted some images. Let me let me read what he wrote. Uh, I submitted a few files for your stream. I'm mostly curious how you would edit the raw file, and I also want to show you how Wavelength Pro. This is something we talked about in a previous stream. Uh, can be can be used to process images with an orange filter, and one of these is that. And then the other one, the other image is made with a, a channel subtraction method developed by Jan Philippe, who's the the uh, the photographer who created the IR Chrome filter. Um, and he used he uses a um, a channel subtraction method to try to to try to imitate what's happening with Aerochrome film. Um, and he's got another video and I, and I've actually put a link. We'll, we'll dive into this a little bit. Um, um, we'll dive into, uh, I, I, we can't get into all the details cause these are both very complicated topics, but I definitely want to look at the images, um, and compare those. Um, so let me, let, let me pull those up. Let me, let me see here. What Kat said, I've done an overall Photoshop and I've seen people use masks, but I haven't uh, done it in Lightroom. Um, Let's see. So let me let me see if I can find an image quick that I think would um, would talk about uh, what what you might do. Let's see here. Me just going off off the cuff on the fly. Um, let's see. Ooh, this might be interesting. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get a little radical here. We'll get a little radical with a with a an image that I took that has some really unusual color casts. Um, and we'll play around. Let's just play around with this for a minute. See what it looks like. Okay, so this is a this is a an image that I took of <clears throat> these uh, skateboarders in a tunnel at night with these weird blue and red lights. Um and um and so uh we, we have these really, really strong uh, color casts that came out of the image, uh, which I actually think makes for a really great image. Uh, but but let's just use this as a baseline. I'm going to save. I'm going to do a snapshot and save this before I make any changes. Um, and so uh, let's look at. So one of the things you might want to do in an image like this is maybe let's let's take a look at the red and see if you could play with it. So. Um, there's a variety of, of, in the past, what I would have done is maybe looked at color grading. Um, so one of the tricks that you can do with color grading is you could, um, uh, you could do, uh, and I've got some color grading that's going on in here that's kind of enhancing the image as well. But you could use color, let me pull, let me just pull this out here, uh, get, get this back to kind of a baseline. So I could use the reverse of a color in color grading. So for example, if I, and let me, let me go into highlights here. It'll be easier. So if I use this, pick at this, this checkbox, this swab, and then the, the color picker, 
I could, and I got to drag it in, and I could pick a spot, and this this will give me the spot on the circle that represents this color. And so now that I have that, I could actually do the reverse of it by adding 180 to this. So that's going to be 180 plus 24 is 204, and that'll give me the opposite. And now that I have that, I can actually use that to kind of affect the amount of that color that exists only in the highlights. Um, so this is one way to do it that targets, this is a way, a way you can deal with color casts by targeting highlights, midtones, or shadows is by doing a color grading and doing a reverse of the color that you want to address. So that's one approach. Um, let me Let me go back to my original settings here. Okay, so that's one approach. The other way would be in masking. Um, and in masking, uh, what you could do is you could create a, uh, a color range, uh, a color range, maybe even a luminance range, depending on what you're doing. And I could do, I could select a color range in this image. Um, and then that would pick up part of the image. Now, I'm gonna have to go into refinement to address this, to kind of isolate a little bit. I might have to refine it down quite a bit. Now at this point, it depends on, again, this is an unusual image, so not, not a, your typical infrared image, but this um, uh, shows you some of the things that you could do. So at this point, I could, in a typical infrared image, I might actually adjust the color temperature and kind of shift the color temperature around. So you actually you can see, I can actually mitigate some of the reds here just by using the, the temperature slider. Um, I might even, you know, make some interesting changes using the, the tint slider, which I don't use quite as often. So that's one approach uh, you could use. And then of course, once you've done this, you could, you could then go back and adjust the refinement as well to see how it's affected. Uh, the other thing I could do is I could adjust the hue of an image once I have once I have selected it. And so now you can see this gives me some real creative possibilities. If I want something to look, um, let's say, I, you know, instead of that, um, the uh, sort of red blue look that this image had, I could go with a whole different set of color combinations. You know, I could do like a yellow or a purple. Uh, and I could do this all by sort of refining uh, the color. There's another thing that, that, I, that I will do as well. Let me, let me hide this one. Another thing you can do is do a luminance range. And this one is interesting. What I can do with luminance is I can, I can do the same thing, kind of grab this as a starting point, but then I can use uh, these, the sliders to really refine what I want to get out of a, um, out of a range. Um, and you can see the green will help me to highlight that. Let's, let's go the other end of the scale. Let's say I want to do something on the, the lower end uh, and I want to adjust those colors that, that are in the shadows. So now that I've selected the shadows, uh, let's just go all the way down and get, get some of the dark shadows here. All right, so now with the green overlay is identified what I'm going to be changing. And now I could do the same thing. I could adjust temp, uh, uh, temp tint, hue, saturation, all of these things to get some you know, pretty different colors. Now, it's not going to be as dramatic in the shadows, but I could also increase the range a little bit uh, to play around with what this looks like. So I will use this technique for um, dealing with, uh, for, for sort of typical, my typical landscape infrared shot. I'll use these kind of techniques with, with the ranges, the color ranges, and the luminance ranges, and other masks to be able to isolate parts of the image that I want to deal, that I either want to negate a color cast that's there, or if I want to enhance some color that's there. Uh, these tools are great for doing that. Um, and so uh, using, using some combination of these, but it's very easy to get, when you're, when you're dealing with the masks, it's very easy to look at the, obviously the new ones, subject, sky, background, people, all that stuff. And it's certainly these traditional ones, the brush, linear, and radial gradient, those are easy go-tos that you're probably familiar with because they've been around in both Lightroom and Camera Raw forever. But don't um, overlook the uh, the color range and the luminance range. Of course, you've got this new one, the depth range. I haven't even gotten into that yet. But don't overlook these because these are really powerful tools for tweaking the color cast in your image. So ho hopefully that gives you some ideas uh, for stuff to work with. 
Uh, let's see. Okay, let me let me get back into the discussion about. Um, let me switch gears here and let me get uh, back into the discussion about the um, uh, wavelength pro and uh, complex channel stuff. Uh, and I want to look at the images um, that were shared. Let me let me pull up. Let me make some tweaks to my screen here so that I can see everything all at once. And then I want to get these images back up. I gotta find the right. All right, so let me do, I'm going to do a, we'll do survey. Uh, we'll do the, the, the end key in Lightroom Classic to give me a survey look so we can look at all of these images. Uh, let me pull this up here. So we'll switch over. Okay, so let's talk about each one of these images. And again, I've got some links that, I'll, that I've put in the description. Um, and I may do future videos on some of these because some of these are uh, kind of interesting topics. Um, and so what we have here is this, the, the, the image on the bottom, um, is, uh, let's see if I'm checking my notes here. Um, so I think, I think the image on the bottom is, is sort of probably a, I'm guessing it's kind of a, a, a typical conversion, um, because you've got, you know, what you'd normally see. Uh, say from some of the Lightroom uh, conversions we've made with the blue sky and this yellow orange foliage, and then the oh, I've lost the file names now. Uh, the I think that one of these images is made with um, uh, Wavelength Pro. Let me go back and grab the file names quick. Uh, let me go back to my grid view. Okay, so it's it's this one. All right, so this image here on the right um, uh, is made with, uh, oh, hang on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna double check this because I wanna get it right. <laughs> uh, let's see here, go back to my grid view. Okay, so this is two, and then the bluer one, okay. The bluer sky is the second one. Okay, go back to survey. All right, so uh, this, let's see, we'll start over here. This one um, is made using this image on the left is is an image made using Wavelength Pro. Wavelength Pro is it's not software that I've used yet. It's sort of um, I guess I would call it alpha or experimental, but it's designed for multi spectral processing. And what it does is it takes uh, images that um, it does some things with infrared that are sort of unconventional uh, for what we would do. It sort of gets into the um, uh, it's I, I guess I might call it like a uh, a channel mixer on steroids. Uh, but the benefit is, is you get some nuance and detail in the color here that you might not get uh, compared to say this bottom image is what kind of the typical look we would have. So this is coming out of uh, Wavelength Pro. Um, and I'll take a look at this in the future. Um, and uh, I'd like to experiment with the software and see what can happen. What the challenge is, is like it's, it's made by an individual. It's not updated very often. Uh, it's Windows only. Um, so there's, there's some limitations there, but, but the results are pretty interesting. And then this image on the right is made using another technique that uh, I'll just basically call uh, channel subtraction. So it's using uh, a lab format as opposed to a, um, an RGB format. Um, and then it is taking uh, different combinations of colors with infrared channels subtracted from them and then recombining them in interesting ways to produce an, another interesting set of colors. So it's a much more complicated process. Um, actually, um, uh, uh, Jan Philippe has a, um, has a whole video that covers this um, that I've linked in the description. So if you're really interested, um, and, and most of his videos are in French, but this, this one's actually in English. So um, I was watching some of his other videos in French. Um, but uh, you can take a look at that video and, and, and he, he shows the process and then he describes the process. It's a little bit more complicated to get through. So I might spend some time looking at both of these and see if I can, particularly the, the channel subtraction that fascinates me because this could be done in Photoshop. And if there's a way that I could simplify this using actions, uh, which he suggested could be done, that could be really interesting. Um, but I, I, I think this is, uh, I want to thank you for sharing, um, these, um, images because this, what I like about this is that it shows us that there's no one right way to process an infrared image, 
There's no, as we talked about earlier, there's no best piece of software uh, to process an infrared image. And look at the subtle uh, variations that you get from the same raw image just by trying some of these different things. So if you're into like experimentation and, and, and that kind of stuff, then you might be interested in these things. I, I am, so I'll dive into these at some point um, when, I, when I have uh, some time because uh, I want to learn more about these. And, and at the very least, I find that these things help me learn more about the sort of the foundational things about why we do the things that we do and why they work and, and, and stuff like that. And so I'm, I'm, uh, so I think this is great. So thank you for, for sharing these images. Um, it's, it's really striking how much, uh, uh, differences, you know, you, you, especially if you look at, if you, if you take a look at the, the, this building on the right here, for example, you can see that you've got in this typical, very typical process, you've got a neutral, colors with some highlights in the reflections and in the foliage. But if you look up in these other variations, you've got all of these other colors happening, these yellows and these reds, and, and we still have a good white balance. You know, it's not like we, the whole image is off the sky. Clouds are still have a good balance. Um, this ground is still pretty neutral, but you, yet there's all of these interesting colors that are happening in the image. Um, this is why, this is another reason I like sharing all the methods for color swapping because because you get some of that, you get some of this in those different methods. Uh, but this kind of takes all that to another level. So awesome. Thanks so much for sharing. Uh, links are in the description for both um, Wavelength Pro if you're adventurous um, or for the video uh, from, um, from Jan Philippe to, to learn more about uh, the, the color swap stuff. And, and I want to learn more about that as well. Um, he's um, a lot of, of course, you know, the creator of IR Chrome. So uh, very knowledgeable about infrared and all of the space. Um, the the videos, most of his, he's done a, a ton of live streams as well, but a lot of his videos are in French. So again, the challenges with, you know, all the different audiences. And, and I know that there's people who watch my videos in other languages or with captions and stuff. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to uh, do the same and, and be willing to watch some other live streams with captions to try to learn some more because he's got some amazing content. All right. Thank you so much for sharing uh, this. I really appreciate it. Okay, uh, let's see here. Ooh, time. Trying to trying to get through it all. Trying to get through it all. Okay, let's see here. I've got three more submissions that I want to get to. Uh, next one we'll do is Win. So Win's got a number of images that were submitted. Let me pull these up. And and this uh, was nice because uh, there's a variety of of both edited. Um, and let's, let's, let's pull up some of these and look at them. I'll do some, we'll do a quick survey here to look at some examples here. Um, let's switch over. All right. So this first one is of the Lone Cypress, uh, from Pebble Beach, uh, which is an amazing location, um, that, that I've been to, and I've got some, some infrared shots of, but, uh, absolutely a gorgeous location. The whole area is gorgeous, but of course this, this particular tree is iconic. Just don't try to sell this image because they'll go after you. It's like a, the, the tree itself is trademarked. It's like the, the Eiffel tower at night or something where you, you, they don't, they don't want you to sell an image of it. It's Pebble Beach owns it. Um, but what we have here is we've got, um, a few, uh, a variety of images. Um, we've got this, the center image is the, like a, like a, an edited, um, monochrome image. Uh, and then we've got, uh, an edited image on the right here, which is, is color, uh, but not channel swapped. And then another kind of, I think this is the actual raw on the left. Uh, but it has, um, the, um, uh, it's just, uh, has a monochrome profile set to it. Now I, before I want to look at, we'll look at editing, you know, the, the color image and, and see what we can do with it. But before I do that, I just want to say that I really like, um, this, uh, monochrome treatment of the center image, uh, the detail in both the, the rocks here and then the rocks here. Uh, I just, I just love it. And then you've got the sky. And another thing is that unfortunately, <laughs> I'm sure you were, you were feeling this, like it's overcast here. You probably would have liked some blue sky, uh, to contrast with some of these other colors, but I travel as well. And I go to places and I, I find myself in an iconic location 
that I would love to get the perfect image of, and there's no blue sky. It just, I, I was traveling last week. I was down in South Carolina and I spent um, the, the week there. It rained almost the whole week and it was overcast and it was dreary. Um, now I did a lot of shooting. I tried to make the best of it. I think I've got some great shots that came out of it, but it's challenging, um, to get the kind of images you want. But I love the fact that you can take that with monochrome, you can bring out all this detail. You can, you can have an amazing image like this, uh, and you're not dependent upon, you know, a blue sky, for example. Uh, I think we, in, in the infrared in general, I think we tend to be a little fixated on blue, blue skies, I'm part of that as well. Um, but but I love to be able to see a great monochrome image like this. So let's dive in and um, look at uh, this image in a little bit of depth um, to, to maybe see the kind of thought process that might have led to um, uh, this kind of an image. So here is the, I think this is the uh, the raw. Yeah, so this is this would be the the, the raw image. And if I just change the profile, you can you can quickly see uh, kind of what you're, what we're dealing with here. So if I white balance, you could white balance on the clouds, which is going to give, make that white, or you could white balance on the granite, uh, which will make everything kind of a little bit of a yellow cast. I'm going to do a quick auto here, uh, to see what this does. So you've got, you've got a little bit of, uh, challenges with the sky. I could definitely see some of the challenges here, um, with, 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 a, an image like this, this might, I think I might've even done when I was shooting this, I might've even shot it like uh, HDR, like multiple exposures, just because of the, the challenges. The other challenge that I noticed when I shot this subject was, and this is a good, another good case of looking at um, uh, the, the, the cast of an image. So for example, if I set uh, the white balance on the sky, because I want the sky to be, uh, to be, you know, white, I could come into uh, I could do a select, let's just do a select subject and I could maybe tweak and but you, you'll notice that the granite, it, this leaves the granite with a bit of a, a purplish violet kind of tone. Uh, one of the things that I might do is come into this and then try to desaturate that. So by using a, the temperature slider, you could come in and play around with this to kind of remove, maybe, maybe a little, take a little, little bit of the green out there. What I would typically do if I was doing this, and I think I did this in that um, uh, that triple uh, uh, white balance video, is I would crank up the vibrance and saturation at a, at a global level, and then come back into this mask, and then go and start tweaking these colors to kind of neutralize uh, the tones that I have, and then uh, it's tricky because you're never going to with all the the color blown out. It's going to be tricky trying to get to the, a neutral, a neutral set of colors, but let's just say we go with that. And then I could come back out here. You're going to have to wash your eyes, wash, wash all the saturation out of your eyes now, but now you can see that, uh, I've neutralized some of the colors in the granite. Um, and, and so you could, you could use that technique to be able to get the white sky that you want and also neutralize some of the color cast that is in the shade, uh, which tends to be more, I think it's more. I don't know if it's subjective. I feel like the color temperature shift in an infrared image between daylight and shade tends to be more dramatic than in visible light. I don't know if that's just me or if I'm just looking at infrared photos all the time, but, but I seem to need to, whenever I have an image that has a lot of shade, I tend to need to do something like that. So, um, that's something to consider if you want to have a, a color treatment of this image. Um, and then if I did a color swap, um, then I could look at, you know, what are the, what are the colors that I wanted to promote? Um, this is kind of interesting. I kind of like this. So, so now, um, now that I've got, you know, a white balance set and I've color swapped and I've neutralized some of the colors of the rock face. Now you're kind of, this is the part where I kind of get into the challenge of what do I want people to be looking at? Do I want them to be looking at the trees? Do I want them to be looking at the rock face? Um, do I want them to be looking at this pool of water or this foliage in the foreground? And this is to me where thinking about color helps me to decide where I want to go next with this image. And this is where I can absolutely see that it's, it's, it's confusing your eye. My eye is drawn to this lower left corner because of this patch of bright, uh, plant life. It's drawn to the pool because of, uh, 
the the color here and the the what's happening. I, I I get a little bit of this texture in here, and then I'm drawn to the color. Your eyes are always drawn to color. Um, and if that's the most important part of the image, then great, continue that route. But if but if there's other things that you want to take out of this, like you know bringing out some of the highlight, I could definitely see where uh, taking an image like this to monochrome makes it a more powerful image. So th that's just a little bit of the thought process that I go through um, that that leads me to decide um, which direction I'm going to go in. I love when I, whenever I was shooting on the California coast, I love the um, one of the things that was always really interesting in color was looking at the uh, the kind of the the edges where the water hits the rock and you you'll notice that it always lights up in infrared and it's because it's loaded with um, life that you don't see like plant life and things that are stuck to the rocks because of all the water that's available to them and you don't see it as much with the naked eye but when you look at it in infrared um, especially these shots along the coast that I would take you'd see all of these um, colorful rings around the rocks by the water. I always thought it was fascinating. To me, it was like a, a sign of life. Like this is where the life is. Um, and you could see life in places where you would think there was no life uh, attached to this granite. You would think there's no life on that granite, but it's loaded with life and you can actually see it in infrared. And I find that really interesting. Okay, let, let me go to the, the other set of images we'll look at. Kind of a similar... Um, similar structure. So the, these are also from the same. So we have the, uh, a black and white image, uh, which is more of a, uh, a final take. Um, and uh, again, I mean, I like the choice here because when I look at, at the, what stands out in this image, you've got this amazing structure in the foreground and you have these amazing clouds that are perfect for this kind of subject and then and then these it's almost like this the the mountain chain becomes like a secondary supporting player in this image um, and so i really like this treatment and and the dark the dark water i love the the contrast that that creates so i really like the treatment that you did here here is um let's see this is a the bottom one is a color treatment that again is not color swapped um and you can see some of the challenges when you, when you look at this type of an image, you've got, first of all, you've got some dramatic tonal changes between the very darks on the right uh, and the bright stuff on the left that all has to be balanced. You can see that's all been largely balanced out here uh, in the in the monochrome version. Um, and, you you know, the, I, there's, there's potential for this image as a color image because you've got these strong colors here and then you've got the strong sky colors. So let's take a look at, let's do a quick edit and, um, and see... Uh, what we get here. So let me see if I can pick this one and we'll get started. So we'll take a quick look at this and I'm going to white balance. You could do the clouds or the rock face. Uh, let's see. Oh, no, nope, it's going to need the 100 to get the amount of color we need. And I, I can't help myself. I have to deal with this. I have to deal with the spot. It's going to drive me crazy. <laughs> so, all right, it's gone. Okay, I'm fine now. I can relax. Okay. Um, and the, the, well, one of the challenges of an image like this is definitely the, the, the tonal range um, and, and dealing with that. So that's, that's super, super, super challenging. I'm going to do a quick auto here, see if I can kind of pull it in. That, that helps pull the highlights down for sure. I would probably just drag the highlights down all the way um, and maybe bring the shadows up a little bit more uh, to try to help balance that out a bit. Um, and you know, I've, I'm seeing stuff in the foreground. He might have uh, removed this stuff from the foreground, which I would, I would, I think that's a good call. Um, it's it it can be a bit of a distraction. I, I tend to like most of my um, like removal aside from spots, but most of my sort of uh, content aware fill type stuff. It tends to be edge stuff that is I just find distracting uh, from the main portion of the image. I, very rarely am I, am I editing something in the center of an image. Um, okay, so let's see. So we've got that. Let's do a look at some color swap options. And you've got some nice color choices here. I mean, this has got some great blue skies. So if you want to go with a blue sky look, teal, something more dramatic. So I don't know, I'm just going to go with like, let's go with like sort of a 
go with the, this split here, this kind of a conventional look. Um, and then I think the main thing is now that we've we've dra we've we've adjusted the highlights and shadows, we need a little bit more contrast back in the image. So that could come here, that could come with the tone curve, or you, you could do this with masks, of course. I would probably do some of this with masks. I think that this foreground is too bright. This needs to be brought down a bit. So let's do a subject quick and see what it looks like. And see if we get, oh, get, get pretty lucky. I might bring the exposure down just a hint, not too much, just a little bit. And then I would probably go in, I'm gonna do this super quick with a brush. Would probably go in and this side of the mountain range Maybe try to just bring the exposure down a little bit. Try to get that more controlled, a little more balanced with the rest. So yeah, I mean, I would spend, this is the kind of image where I would spend probably 90% of my time is going to be masking, you know, masking the island, masking the mountains, probably the left side, the right side, the sky, the water, uh, masking everything, and then subtly tweaking all of these things. This is this is a great image because you can. Uh, there's so much possibility here. You you could you could do a color treatment with all kinds of color options. Uh, you can do the monochrome treatment, which looked great. Uh, the water making that water really dark um, is is really cool. You could add more contrast to the sky. Uh, the the contrast was definitely uh, popped more in the monochrome image because that black on the clouds on black is just a. I love that look. It's it creates an amazing look, and you're you're not gonna get you can get a little bit of that with uh, a color image, but you're gonna end up with a lot of saturation as a result. So yeah, um, this is a this is a a, a great image. Uh, very very envious of being able to shoot at a place like this. Uh, the water, uh, the sky, uh, the mountains, the island, fantastic, absolutely fantastic. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, I think that. Uh, uh, not uh, when when you've got a great image like this, I, I, I jokingly say that they edit themselves, but but I think that's because like you you've got so, any of the treatments we talked about colors monochrome they all look fantastic with an image like this. So thanks so much for sharing. Very nice work. Uh, let's see here. So that was uh, that was from Win. So thank you, Win, for sharing all of your images. I really appreciate it. All right, let's see here. I've got a question. Let me let me check the chat. I've got to catch up with the chat here and see what's going on. Um, let's see, see if I've missed anything. Um, would love to try actual error chrome at least once. Yeah, I mean, it's expensive. You know, it's 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 kind of a nuisance and stuff. So, um, me too. But I don't know if I'll ever get the opportunity to. Um, let's see here. Phil saying the best part of IR editing in, in this channel is learning all of the editing techniques that you would never use under normal circumstances. I thank you for, for that. And, and I agree. Um, I've been able to take things that I've learned here and apply them to visible light photography and things that I would have never done in visible light photography. I don't do a lot of visible light, but when I do, I just, I think about colors differently and I, and I treat it differently and it's really opened up. It's really opened up the possibilities for me. Um, so I, I absolutely agree. Um, hello, Klaus. Uh, let's see. Okay, so let me dive in. I've got, I want to try to uh, wrap this up um, in the, within a couple hours, but I've got more to cover here. Uh, although we talked, Lou, um, we had this question and we kind of talked about this earlier, but I'll just recap it. Two filter related questions. I shoot with a full spectrum Nikon. Crop sensor camera D7200. Question one, can I use this full spectrum camera for astrophotography or do I need to get some other filter? Uh, you actually can use that camera for full spectrum, absolutely. Um, uh, full spe For astrophotography, yeah. Y yes, you can use the full spectrum. And as we talked about earlier, there's a variety of filters you could use. You can shoot in full spectrum. Some subjects will work well. You could shoot with narrow band filters. You've got all of the options available. Uh, but for Milky Way, um, I would try shooting full spectrum and see see what that looks like. I think that would be pretty interesting. Uh, but you can also throw a hot mirror on and just shoot it, you know, sort of standard. So you've got all the options available with full spectrum camera, um, for sure. Uh, the second question that Lou had was, conventional wisdom seems to be, if you've got a full spectrum, you need to shoot with filters. Putting aside 
uh, clip-in filters, is there any point in carrying lenses that don't take filters such as those with a bulbous front element like a fisheye? So this is a challenge. This could be a challenge for um, uh, for fisheye lenses. And I, you, I was showing you one earlier. I shoot. I like to shoot fisheye. I think combining infrared with other um, techniques and styles makes it more interesting. Um, but it's challenging. The the fisheyes that I use, I tend to use with clip-in filters. And so that's, uh, that gives me that advantage of being able to shoot with a variety of, of filters that are clip-in without the fact that the, uh, the lens doesn't have a, um, doesn't have a threads, uh, to be able to thread in. Um, so, it, but, but if you're, if you have a full spectrum camera, I mean, I have this, the advantage of, I have like both full spectrum and a converted to 590. So sometimes I will throw a fisheye lens on the 590 and I don't need any filters. So that, that's an advantage. But with full spectrum, you don't have that capability. You're kind of limited to um, clip-in filters. And there's, aside from threaded filters, just, just not other good ways um, to, to filter light in that sense because you, there's not really square infrared filters. And if there would, there'd be too much light leakage, which is why they don't exist. So yeah, that's definitely a challenge um, um, to, to shoot with those types of lenses. That's why like in the lenses on, on my blog, where I start listing out, where I list all the, um, both the Fuji and vintage um, lenses that I look at, I try to put the filter thread size because, or, or identify that there's no threads. Uh, because it's a factor. It's a big factor for infrared. So I don't have a, I don't have an easy solution for that aside from, you know, look for a, look for a lens that uh, does, that is maybe the wide or the fisheye that you want that maybe has um, filter threads or go to clip in. Um, but, but again, if your camera doesn't support that, especially like a DSLRs don't typically support that. So that's challenging. Um, it really limits the choices there. Um, you're going to, you're, because you're going to need a, probably a mirrorless camera to get the clip in filter. And even then, I don't know if every model's covered, um, or you're going to need to find a lens that will support that. So you're kind of constrained there, uh, with, with that. Uh, let's see. And, um, uh, Klaus says, uh, I always use full spectrum cameras and put clip in filters, dual narrow band. Yeah. And I, I've got a dual narrow band as well that I want to try. Um, and then they, they IR cut filters. Uh, but again, not for DSLRs. Um, this is one of the areas where mirrorless has an edge over uh, DSLRs. Um, I, I think that um, the things like, th there's some high-end DSLRs that will have things like focus peaking and other kind of advanced features, um, and maybe like, a, you know, uh, levels, uh, electronic levels and stuff. But by and large, these features tend to be more limited to mirrorless cameras, and that's an area where they have an edge. Okay, I've got one more set of images that I want to cover today from Phil, um, and let me find those, and we'll take a look at those images. So let's see, going into my... Um, he's got three three images that are in sets again with the um, with a RAW and a JPEG. So let's kind of step through... Let's step through some of these. Let me, I'm going to, I'm going to pick, they're very uh, similar in style. So I might just pick a couple of them. Let's pick, let's start here. Cause I think this is really interesting. So I'll go to my develop module and let me share with what I'm looking at. All right. So uh, we've got this image and we'll start with, of course, getting a profile so I can check white balance. Uh, 50 doesn't quite get, it's, pretty, it's probably not bad. It visually looks good, but because it's at 2000, I'm going to actually switch to hundred and give me more range if I ever wanted that later on. So there we go. So I've got, I've white balance on the clouds. Uh, this looks like a, probably a 590, excuse me, 590 nanometer image, maybe 665, but probably 590. Uh, let's see. Um, and, um, so I've got a good, good white balance here and, you know, and again, you don't need to color swap. You could keep these colors. Um, there's, I'm, I'm trying that more and more with certain subjects, um, to, to not do a color swap, but, it, but I, for this one, I think I will, uh, 
uh, we'll take a look. Oh, or maybe not because I may not have uh, profiles for this camera. So that's interesting. Um, I could uh, switch over to Photoshop. Uh, let me let me let me do that real quick. Edit in Photoshop. So I'll open up Photoshop and then uh, another question I'll read in chat while this is loading. Um, I have a few other topics I think are interesting and perhaps a little different than what you usually review. Should I submit? Yeah, I mean, so let me tell you, let me, I'll talk a little bit about my process, <laughs> I, my process, uh, for, for like making videos and selecting subjects. I have a, I have a backlog of <laughs> way too many. I was telling, I was telling Kat about this, uh, last year. Um, I have way too many images to, or, or subjects that I want to cover. Um, but I've started to organize them based upon um, what I think I'll get to. And, and and these could be things like, you know, lenses or techniques or editing or just all kinds of stuff um, and more than I can cover. And so typically what I'll do is if I find something interesting, I will drop it in that list and then I've got like a research bucket and I'll just start like adding like either links to websites or products or videos or whatever to help me, you know, let, let the, it, it, uh, <laughs> try to think of the right word, uh, grow, uh, uh, in my mind and see if it, if it, if it takes flight and, and, and then maybe I'll try to shoot some stuff that would support that video or, or try to do some edits. And then if I think it gets to like a mature enough point where I've either shot enough and I'm, and I'm, I'm well-versed with the technique or whatever it is, then I, it'll rise to the top of my list and then I'll make a video. Um, so that's kind of my process. And so, if you want to inject yourself into that process, then you've got you've got a couple choices. You can send me stuff for a future live stream. Unfortunately, though, with the live stream, like like we talked about when we showed your other images, I'm only going to be able to like talk about them at a high level. It, I won't because when I research something, I tend to spend a lot of time on it, and I won't have the time to do that in a live stream. So we can certainly look at stuff. I'm happy to share ideas and look at stuff in a live stream, but I won't have the time to like deep dive into it. Maybe unless unless I. It's really interesting and I end up doing it before the live stream, but I've been traveling a lot lately. I haven't had time uh, recently. Uh, the other way to approach this is to just send me an email and say, hey, I'm really interested in this or this software or this thing, um, and I'd love to get your take on it. Um, and so like with these these other things, I will definitely um, be, be diving in and trying to learn more about these things and see if there's, you know, see if there's, if there's parts of these techniques that I can bring to the foreground that will be good for a lot of people. I don't want to like, I don't want to share something that is like, oh, here's a, here's a thing. And there's a million steps you got to do on every photo, but the results are great, but you got to do a million steps on every photo. I, I don't want to do a million steps and I'm sure other people don't want either. So I would always try to find a way to simplify that. So if I think there's something in there, I'll definitely talk about it, but there's a, there's a research component to this. There's a, uh, these things have to percolate um, in, in my mind and in my list and in my shooting and in my research before they get to the point where a video is made. Um, I, someday maybe I'll talk about the actual process that, that I take to make a video, but it probably takes me to make a, you know, a 10 minute video probably takes me about, I don't know, 30 to 40 hours of work. Um, and that doesn't even include shooting. That's just like front, like, that's writing and researching and all the prep work. So it's very time consuming. And so, and I've tried to reduce that time to make it faster, but it still takes time. Um, and that limits, you know, how much I can put out and all this kind of stuff. So that's, that's probably more than you wanted to know, or if maybe if somebody wants to know more, I can walk through my whole process and show you my, my giant list, um, of stuff that I'll never get to. Um, but that's, that's a little, if you, if you want to try to inject yourself into that process, there's a little bit of it. Uh, let's see, look at chat here before I dive into this image. Um, for those who can't afford a conversion, get a Sony 828 and disable the filter blocker with a magnet. Yep. I've seen, I've seen that. That's definitely, um, that's definitely a really interesting one. I've thought about doing that, but again, I think it's on my list. <laughs> it's another one that's on my list, but I've watched like a video of the magnet stuff and that's really fascinating. Um, uh, dream world images said I prefer clouds to blue skies. Some people certainly do. Uh, absolutely. Um, and it, it, it's, it's like, uh, Again, no right or wrong answers, personal preference. There's no, you know, I, I cover a lot of, I feel like a lot of the work that I do is helping people to understand the basics, not because 
I think that you have to do it this way when you make an image, but because I want to try to help people understand why you do the basics and then give you the freedom to say, go break the rules. You know, it's, it's the old, I'm going to teach you all the rules so you can go break the rules. Um, and you should, you should absolutely be able to do that. Um, and so, uh, there's definitely no, there's no right or wrong way to do this. Um, and some, some, there's certain subjects that come out better with a blue sky. There's certain subjects that come out better overcast. So absolutely personal preference. I totally support that. Um, so a little discuss, discussion about the, the eight two eight. So I'll let, I'll let, I'll let that carry on in the chat. Um, it's, it's fascinating though. Like these, the, these old cameras, it's, it's almost like a hack, uh, hack, uh, approach. Okay. So let's get back to this image. So, uh, if I want to color swap this in Photoshop and do a control zero to make it full screen, I'm going to go to actions up here and then I can pull up my actions and I can try, let me just try a regular swap, see what that looks like. Oh, I've got this like teal sky and kind of a salmonish uh, foreground. That's kind of interesting. I'm going to, I'm going to hide that layer. I'm going to pick another one. Let me pick an invert. So more of a, a royal blue sky um, and kind of a yellowish goldish uh, foliage. And let me do one more. Let me do a split. See what that looks like. So uh, kind of similar to the first one. I actually think I like the invert. So this is this is kind of nice. So here, um, uh, at this point, you know, working in Photoshop, I could continue to work in Photoshop, um, or I could just save this um, and uh, go back to uh, Lightroom uh, to be able to make more changes. So let me do that. Let me save this. Go back to Lightroom. And then, um, all right, I had a bit of a, a, a bit of a, a blip there in the, in the stream. So let me see if it's picking up yet. Okay. Okay. I think it's recovered now. So apologies there. Uh, let's see. I think the stream's getting back to healthy again. All right. So we're, we're, we're wrapping up here. So I'll, I'll close up. I'll, I think I'll wrap up on this image. Um, so, uh, let's see. So I, I don't know if this came through or if it was lost, but, um, the, I this is a definitely an image where I would spend more time masking, you know, the sky to do some dehazing, maybe this background mountains to do maybe a little dehaze there. Uh, the uh, mask, the, the primary structure here, maybe increase the exposure slightly, um, and maybe play with contrast there. And then maybe like a, uh, a radial, uh, gradient at the bottom or a, a linear gradient to maybe draw the attention up. So a little bit more time I would spend on masking here, but this is kind of the general, uh, the general direction that I would go in. I'll just do a quick auto here. See, see what that kind of looks like. Brightens it up a little bit, maybe add a little bit of contrast. So that's kind of the direction that I would go in. Uh, let me compare this with, um, let's see, I'm going to go back to my grid view here. I'm going to compare this with the version that, um, so here's the version uh, that uh, was uh, that Phil was submitted. Um, and so you can see, you know, very similar. Um, let's see, which one is which? Go back here. So this is the this is the uh, the bright yellow one is the one that I brought over from Photoshop. Okay. So the one on the left is the one that I've brought over from Photoshop. The changes that I've made, and then the one on the right is his version. So pretty similar, you know, slight difference in colors, slight difference in treatment uh, for what that can look like. But again, that's purely subjective. Um, I would say, you know, I be careful of the, the sky getting too oversaturated. Um, sometimes that can be challenging when the sky is too blue. Um, it can look, uh, it looks kind of a little, little odd here, not terrible, but something to keep in mind. So just kind of watch the saturation. Sometimes I'll even desaturate the sky a little bit. Um, but aside from that, you know, the, the treatment looks good. Your white balance looks great. White balance looks great. Um, 
and the treatment of this, you know, is, is very solid. Uh, and I think the color you select or the style that you use is purely subjective. So whichever one you, you like there looks good. So thank you. Thank you for submitting that image. Um, and, uh, the other images, Phil submitted a few, but they're basically all in a very similar style to this. So I'm just going to stick to this one for today. So, uh, let me, let me wrap up here. Um, I want to, I'm going to double check my list here. I think I've, yay, I've covered everything on the list. So thanks everybody for, um, uh, for sticking around, uh, and, and for, um, uh, for participating. If you're interested in having, uh, if you have a question you'd like to me to cover in a future stream, or if you have images, then you can go to, uh, the, um, the link here at the bottom of the screen, uh, 590.red slash live. And I'll have links where you can submit, uh, new questions and new images to look at. Uh, I'm always happy to do that. Um, if you could, if, if you have more in-depth stuff you, that you want to talk about, you could send me an email. Uh, but thank you everybody for participating. Um, please, uh, if you haven't done so, take a look at my book at infraredbook.com. Um, and you can get a ton of information on my YouTube channel or at my blog. So check those sources out as well. Thank you everybody for stopping by. I really appreciate it. Have a good one.